Satan because you are king, the Yah of Israel. And we thank you, Father, and our hope is in you, in Yeshua HaMashiach's name, Selah. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom, saints. Thank you for coming and getting on the call. And uh, we're going to go into the word today because that's why we're here. We're here to learn and we're here to be enlightened. We're here to, we have already studied to show ourselves approved. And every day we're studying to get more and more knowledge and more and more understanding. And as we begin to have these words be hidden in our heart that we won't sin against the most high, then and only then we'll be, begin to walk in that newness of life, taking a part of that uh, divine nature. And we thank the Father for his word because the scriptures tell us, be not conformed to this world. There's a whole lot going on in our world. There's a whole lot going on in our time. But we are not going to be conformed to this world, but we're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the only way for our minds to be transformed, we have to have it transformed by and through the word. The word is the filter. The word is the standard. The word of Yah, if it doesn't come and line up with the scriptures, then that's something that we don't need in our life. And so we bring everything in our life up to the standard of the word. Are y'all hearing that? Everything in our life has to come up to the standard of the word because the word is something that was given to us from above and it came down from heaven. And now we're feasting on the word. We don't want to feast like we've been feasting. We don't want to partake of devils and demons, but we want to take partake of the of Yaqua's table and we want to dine on him tonight on the word uh, and, and the truth of the word. Hallelujah. Uh, today, we're going to talk just a little bit about Yaqua's desire to live among us because that was his desire from the very beginning. And we understand that that's the name Yaqua that he revealed to Moses when Moses asked, who uh, is he going to tell the church of Israel is speaking to him through the burning bush? And he told him his name was Yaqua, and that would be his name that he would begin to refer to in regards to the children of Israel. And we understand that Yaqua was really Yeshua Hamashiach in the New Testament. Before he became Yeshua Hamashiach, we knew him as Yaqua, and he's been among us from the very beginning. He declared he was the Alpha, he was the Omega, he was the beginning, he was the end, he was the first voice we heard, and he's ultimately going to be the last voice we hear. Hallelujah. So to him be the glory, the honor, and power both now and forever. What we see before us is the desire of Yaqua wanting to live among his people. We see the tabernacle in the middle, and we see the 12 tribes of Israel. We see the Levitical priesthood there dwelling closer uh, to the presence of the Most High. But he was always wants to dwell in our midst. And so let's enjoy uh, this lesson today. Let's, let, let, let's celebrate and party as we begin to hear the word of Yaqua today. Brother Leo, are you on the line? Yes, sir. I'm here. You want to do some reading today? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Say la. Right. Hold on. Here we go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. Come on, what it say, brother? And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is so important for us to know and get in our spirits. We've been establishing uh, these verses and these passages within our spirit and our mind so that we can begin to understand the layout of Yaqua's plan and how the story goes so that we can understand it as Israelites so that we can bring light to those that don't know and we can shed light for those that don't know and understand what is happening and what's going on. So it says, and Yaqua said, let us make man in our image and after mm -hmm. our likeness. likeness. Come on, what it say? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so the father said he's going to make us in his image 
He's going to make us after his likeness, and he's going to literally give us dominion over the works of his hand. He's going to give us dominion. He's going to give us dominion. <clears throat> and this dominion that he is declaring and this dominion that he is talking about is the dominion over everything that he made. He's given us dominion over the fish that's in the sea. He's given us dominion over the fowls of the air. He's given us dominion over all of the creeping things that's creeping upon the earth. He's given us uh, dominion over the works of his hand. He gave us dominion over everything that he created and he made. Come on, brother, what it say? So God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what we see again is the creator creating us in his own image, in his own likeness. And this is very important for us to know and understand that we have been created in the image and in the likeness of the Most High. And because we have been created in that image of the Most High, we there's a way that we ought to behave and there's a way that we ought to function. And that way that he wanted us to function was he wanted us to be fruitful. He wanted us to multiply and to replenish the earth and to subdue it. And again, have dominion because that's what people who are created in the image and likeness of the creator was supposed to do to have dominion over the fish, over the works of his hand, the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Uh-huh. Come on, let's find out what happened over here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. What did it say? And Yahuwah, God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And man became a living soul. Isn't that interesting? This is how we were formed. This is why it says that we were made a little lower than the angels because he formed us out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And, and when he breathed into us the breath of life, then we became living souls. We became alive. So without his breath of life, then we become dead souls. Without his breath, man is a dead soul, which means our bodies cannot function without the breath of Yahweh being in our nostrils. Hallelujah. Come on, what did it say, brother? And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So what I want y'all to know and what I want you to understand is that when he formed us, out of the dust of the ground, that was in a different place. That wasn't in the Garden of Eden that he formed us out of the dust of the ground, but he formed us outside of the garden. He formed us with that particular dust of the ground. And then after he formed us and brewed the breath of life within us, then he made a garden. He made a garden eastward in Eden. And there he brought us into this garden of Eden. And, and, and he wanted us to partake and be a part of this garden and be a part of this system that he had created for man to be inside of. Come on, what did it say? And out of the ground made Yahuwah God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So out of the ground, he made every tree for food, things that were gonna be pleasant to the eye, but also in the garden, there was the tree of life there. And there was also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These trees was all there, but the tree of life was not a tree, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not a tree in the sense of what we know a tree to be. But these were actually people that were in the garden. The tree of life 
we're going to discover that it was Yeshua HaMashiach because he was there all the time. He's been there from the very beginning. Matter of fact, he declared that no man has seen or heard the father at any time. It's only the son that has come out the bosom of the father. He's the one that has declared him unto us. So Yeshua was this tree of life that was in the garden from the very beginning. Why? Because it's Yahweh's desire to dwell with his creation and with his people. So he was there in the beginning. Yeshua, the tree of life, and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know that was Satan, the devil, the serpent. And we're going to find out in a little while how we know that Satan, the devil, was there in the garden also. Uh, uh, so this is going to be good for us to know and understand. So Yeshua was there and Satan the devil was there and we were there all in the garden. Here is the command that the Mosaic gave to uh, Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. What does it say, brother? And Yahuwah God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou that eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now we don't know how much time has been going past since the man has been on the earth. We don't know how long and much time has went past since he was working in the garden, doing the things that he was doing in the garden, we don't know how long of time had went past uh, that this man was uh, doing what he was doing uh, in the garden. But what we do know is that every tree in the garden, they were able to freely eat from. And as long as they ate from every tree, uh, except for the tree that was in the midst of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, men lived and they lived and they lived. But the moment they was to eat off of this tree that they were forbidden to eat off of, that's when death and dying was actually introduced into our system. But prior to that, we didn't know anything about death. All we knew was life. That's all we knew about was life and living and, uh, and, and walking and talking with the creator. Because what we're talking about today is Yaqua's desire to dwell among his creation, to dwell among us. And where we are, we are made on the earth, okay? Let's see what this man did with this commandment. Genesis chapter three, verse one. What did it say? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahuwah God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So we're going to find out who this serpent is. We understand that the woman understood what the commandment was, that they can eat off all the other trees but they're not supposed to eat off the tree that's in the midst of the garden. And she's having this conversation uh, that looks like it's a serpent, but we understand that serpents don't speak. But nevertheless, that's what it looks like to us. Let's go over and find out who this serpent truly is, okay? Let's find out who this serpent is that she's speaking to and talking to. Revelation chapter 12, verse seven. What does it say, brother? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. I want y'all to notice something, that Michael, that's standing for Yaqua and the truth of the kingdom of Yaqua, fought against this dragon and his angels, and they did not prevail. The dragon and his angels, they didn't prevail against Michael and his angels. It says, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So in other words, this dragon had to be removed from the heavenly realm and from the heavenly place. 
Look over here in verse 9 and look at what it says. Come on. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This lets you know who this serpent was that she was talking to. And this lets you also know that it wasn't only the serpent and the dragon, the devil that was casted out who had deceived the whole world, but also his angels, the ones that he had brought or, or, or gathered together with him in the heavenly places, they were cast out among him too, which lets you know that all of them as a group are called the devil, mm -hmm. Satan, that deceiveth the whole world. Remember, Satan is not omnipresent like Yahweh is, being in all places uh, at all times. So what that hit, helps you to understand is that this is how it seems like the devil is all over the place. What's well, because he had help and he not only was he kicked out, but all of his angels was kicked out too. And all of that group, all of that group is called the devil, Satan, that deceived the whole world. Are y'all hearing that today? <clears throat> Come on, let's go back over to Genesis 3 and finish the story. What did it say? And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Right there, that's the first lie. That's the first lie that the serpent was, 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 was saying and speaking, saying you shall not surely die when you disobey the Most High. And people to this day, because the Bible talks about, because the judgment of Yahweh doesn't become, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, is not speedient. He doesn't uh, uh, kill you right away or you don't die immediately, uh, so to speak, that people continue on in sin and continue on in transgression and continue on in iniquity because his judgment is not enacted immediately. So this is what the serpent was telling the woman. Hey, you ain't going to surely die. He, you ain't going to surely die. You ain't going to die physically. You ain't going to die spiritually. Ain't nothing going to happen to you. You're not going to die. Look at what he said over here in verse 5. Come on, what it say? For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be just as God's, knowing good and evil. See, we don't want to be just as God. We don't want to be as him. We want to be him. We want to be in that family. So he was giving us a little truth. You shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. But the father says, ye are God's, you see? So he gave them some truth in the midst of telling them lies. And, and what that began to uh, have them or have her begin to see, she began to see this fruit in the midst of this garden of the knowledge of good and evil. She began to look at this tree in a different way, in a different way. Truth mixed with lies is deception. And that's what the world is filled with. It's filled with truth mixed with lies. And if you don't know which one is which, you'll always find yourself being deceived because it was the lie that was a part of that truth that caused the deception to begin to happen and to manifest itself. Let's see what the woman did after she began to look at this tree a little bit differently based on the information that she was receiving from this serpent, from this devil, from this Hasatan. Come on, what did it say? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So y'all see, she looked at the tree in a different way. All of a sudden, the tree began to look good for food. It began to look pleasant to her eye, and, and it was a tree that she began to desire, saying, man, this is going to make me wise. And she took and ate from that tree. She didn't eat with her mouth, but she ate with her mind. She ate with her mind. She gave her mind over to deception. And when she gave her mind over to that deception, she gave it also to her husband too. And he ate from that deception. 
Okay, let's find out what they really ate so that you can understand what I'm talking about when I said that she ate with her mind and that she was eating deception. Look at what it says in Hosea chapter 10, verse 13. What did it say, brother? For ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way and the multitude of thy mighty men. So what she ate was the fruit of lies. That's what they ate, the fruit of lies. And because they ate the fruit of lies, they got all off and got, this, got all off into deception and their eyes was open and they realized that they were naked and all of these things began to happen because all they did was ate off the fruit of lies and they went their own way. They didn't trust in Yahweh's way, but they trusted in their own way. This is why the psalmist says, lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So none of that went on. They leaned to their own understanding and they started walking in their own way, in their own path. And this caused them to be deceived and caused uh, Eve to be deceived. And Adam wasn't deceived. He knew what she did and he started eating off of the same lies that she was eating off of, the fruit of lies. That was the fruit that uh, was, was, was that the Most High was warning them not to partake of. The table of Satan, and they wasn't eating from the table of Yahweh. Come on, what happened to them? Let's see what, what their ultimate uh, outcome began to happen after they ate off of uh, the fruit of lies. What happened to them? And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Then they sewed fig trees, fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Y'all see that? Their eyes were open. They begin to have some knowledge and some new information. They begin to see and understand that, man, we're naked. We're naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves apron. Now I want y'all to see the next verse because we need to understand who is walking on the earth. We need to know that he's that Yeshua has always been here with us on the planet, on earth. Look at Genesis 3 and 8, what it say? And they heard the voice of Yahuwah, God, walking in the garden. In the no, he was walking in heaven. In the garden. No, he was walking in the third heaven. In the garden. In the Y'all see the this here. <laughs> His voice was not in heaven because we were never designed to be in heaven in the first place. But because of this doctrine, Everybody is, 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 they see this, they read this, but still it, it doesn't process in their mind that he was walking in the garden because Yahweh has always desired to be here on the earth. Are y'all hearing this? So they heard his voice of the Lord God walking in the garden on, in the earth, on the earth, okay? When was he doing this, brother? In the cool of the day. Yes. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahuwah God amongst the trees of the garden. So Adam and his wife thought that they could hide themselves from the presence of the Most High. Let's look at him walk among us here. Come on, what did it say? And Yahuwah God caught on to Adam and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. No, he heard his voice in heaven. In the garden. He heard his voice screaming from a lofty and high place in the heavenly realm. <laughs> in the garden. No, he heard his voice in the garden where he was. He heard his voice in the garden where he was because Yeshua was walking among us. Come on. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. Okay, so so so, so y'all get that? He heard his voice in the garden. He didn't hear his voice in some uh, lofty place of coming out of the clouds. He heard his voice in the garden. And he said he was afraid because he was naked and he hid himself. Look at what the uh, father responds of 
And she will respond to him. Look at here. What did he say? And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? How's thou eating of the tree where I've commanded thee that thou shalt not eat? So he, he told me, he said, hey, who, who told you he was naked, man? Now that's some new information. I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you that information. I didn't give you that information. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten off of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat it? So he's bringing it right to the man, letting you know, I didn't give you that information, but somebody gave you that information. And he's saying, this tree that I told you not to eat off of, this information that I told you not to receive, you received it. And now it's causing you to be afraid and trying to hide yourself from my presence. Look at what happened over here in Genesis 3 and 22. We're skipping down. Come on, what it say? And Yahuwah God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So what? He was letting the father know because Yeshua was speaking to the father. He said, behold, the man has become as one of us. And he now understands what good and evil is. And he understood that the man being made from the dust of the ground would always lean towards the evil, not so much the good. So he said, let's take now and put forth his hand and take also the ability for him to live forever in this state of rebellion or this state of knowing good and evil. Let's, let's, let's take away the tree of life because if we had learned how to live forever, we, Adam would still be walking here among us. Eve would still be walking here among us, knowing good and evil. So he cut that off and, 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 and took us away and barred the way from the tree of life so that we wouldn't eat and live forever. We would have found out how to live forever, saints. Come on, what did it say? Therefore, Yahuwah God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Stop right there. So the father took him and removed him out of the Garden of Eden. And where did he take him to? He took him back to the place where he was created from. He took him back to that particular ground of where he was taken from. This is why I tell you, the, the ground of Eden, Adam wasn't made from that ground, but Adam was made from the ground outside of the Garden of Eden because he sent him right back to the place where he was taken from because the ground that was in the Garden of Eden, because Yeshua was walking on that ground, that ground became what kind of ground? Holy ground, set apart ground. So therefore, he couldn't remain in the holy ground and in a holy place he had to be removed from that holy ground and that holy place and put back to where he was created from that particular ground. And we understand that the ground that was in Eden was different from the ground that was in from where he was taken from. Because the ground in Eden brought forth and produced all kind of life. It brought forth the trees. It brought forth all of these things. But the ground that was outside of the garden was a hard ground was a ground that made that man have to sweat and labor and work that ground. But in the Garden of Eden, everything was made and everything was done for him. Everything was easy there. But all of a sudden, when he got on the outside, the ground was hard. He had to work it. He had to till it. And by the sweat of his brow, he was going to be eating meat all the days of his life. So I want y'all to see that here in this text. Come on, what it say? So he sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he didn't uh, uh, put the cherubim to bar his way to the Garden of Eden, but he put the cherubim and with the flaming swords turning every way to keep the way of the tree of life. 
because they can no longer have access to Yeshua HaMashiach. And we know he was a true life. They can't have access to him because if they have access to the tree of life, then they're going to learn how to live forever. So the father barred him, barred them from coming back in the way of where the tree of life was. Okay. And we know Yeshua is the tree of life. And the cherubims were on either side with flaming swords guarding the way to him. Are y'all hearing that today? Let's find out who sits between the cherubim, because this is important. The Ark of the Covenant. I have a, a, a Ark of the Covenant here, right here. Let me show y'all this real quick. This is my camera. I have a little Ark of the Covenant here right before me. I always look at this. This is always before me when I um, teach the class. All right, so what you see on your screen is the Ark uh, of the Covenant. And on that Ark of the Covenant, you see uh, the, the, the cherubim uh, there, all right? And you see the angels or the cherubim guarding the mercy seat, all right? And this is the Ark of the Covenant. This is how it was designed. This is how it looked, okay? And uh, there was a mercy seat in between the cherubim. So this is what we have to understand how the scriptures and the, and the word connects and helps us to understand. The same way the cherubim guarded the way of life, we're going to find out who sits in between the two cherubims. Psalms 99 and 1. This is going to let us know that this was Yeshua. This was the Most High. Come on, what does it say? Psalms 91 and 1. 99 yeah. and 1. What does it say? 99 and 1. And Yahuwah reigneth. Let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. Hallelujah. So he's sitting between the cherubim. He's being guarded. The way of life is being guarded. He's sitting there between the cherubim on the mercy seat because that's what the Father has given us. The reason why he hasn't destroyed us again with, with, with water. He said he wouldn't. He gave us a a, a, a promise in the sky that he wouldn't destroy the world with um, with water again. And the reason why he destroyed us was because the heart of our imagination, every, uh, uh, ever since the time that they ate off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says man's heart began and their imaginations grew wicked and wicked every single day from that point as they had children being born to them and the people started being born and the earth began to be replenished. There was nothing but wickedness and more wickedness increasing in the heart and in the mind of the people where the father said, you know what? I repented that I made this man. So he said, I'm going to destroy this man off the face of the planet in whom I created. But oh, if, it's, if, if it wasn't for Noah, Noah and his three sons, that's how the earth was repopulated because Noah found grace in the sight of Yahweh. He found grace and he told him to make him an ark and uh, for your family and those three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth and their wives and Noah and his wife got on that ark and that's how humanity was saved and rescued and that's why you and I are here today because of Noah and his three sons. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, we know now who sits between the cherubims. Let's go to Exodus chapter uh, 25 and 1 and 2, and we're going to skip down through here so we can understand how the Father or how uh, uh, Yeshua wanted to always, desired always to be among his people. Come on, Exodus chapter 25 and 1. What did it say? And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Stop right there. He asked Moses to speak to the children of Israel that they would bring the Most High an offering. And he says, Only the ones that are willing. That's how you have to bring an offering to the most high. If your heart is not willing to bring an offering to the most high, then you need to keep it 
Keep your offering, keep it in your pocket, keep it in your hand and keep it to yourself. Because if you're not giving an offering that is coming from the heart, a willing offering, a willing, uh, uh, something that's coming from you because you're willing to do it, then the father does not want it. He doesn't want anything from you that you're not willing to give with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul. So he told every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take an offering from them, the ones that are willing to give and bring an offering. And what were they bringing this offering for, brother? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Y'all see that? Not bringing them up into heaven, but for him to come down to the earth and dwell among them. So we have to establish this in our soul, establish this in our mind to know that the father desires not to bring us up into the heavenly heavens, but he dwell, he, his desire is to dwell here on the earth with his people. Are y'all hearing that today? Come on. What do you say? According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So the Mosai was declaring to Moses and the children of Israel, look here, I want you to make a sanctuary for me to dwell in. And here up in the heavenlies, I'm used to a certain decor. I'm used to a certain uh, 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 style and a way of, uh, of life here in the heavenly realm. So I want you to make sure that you make everything that I'm showing you, Moses, according to the pattern. I want you to make everything that I'm telling you to create and to make, I want you to make it according to this particular pattern. Are y'all hearing that today? Because the Most High is used to a certain decor. You can't make something any kind of way and expect for, 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 for the creator to dwell there. He won't do it. He's only going to dwell if things are according to the pattern that he has set. Are y'all hearing that? So he told him to make a mercy seat of pure gold. Make a mercy seat. And he gave him how long he wanted him to make it. He gave them the, the height and the breadth, the length of it so that they were supposed to make this exactly the way he wanted them to make it. Come on, brother, what did it say? And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And we just got through seeing that Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubs being on either ends and the mercy seat in the middle. Okay, come on. Watch what he say is going to happen when you do this. Come on. And there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims which are upon the Ark of the Testimony. Of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So what did he say? He said, I'm going to meet with you and I'm going to communicate with you above the mercy seat. Not above in the clouds, not above the roof, not above outer space. Come on. But he said, I'm going to communicate with you above the mercy seat that you make on the earth. I'm going to give you Every command that I'm giving to the children of Israel, I'm going to communicate with you above that mercy seat on that ark that you're making, that tabernacle that you're making. Are y'all hearing that today? So he has been there all the time, and his desire has always been to dwell among his people. This is, this is his desire. This is his desire to dwell among his people. Numbers chapter 7, verse 1. Come on, what it say? And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle 
and he had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both on the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them. And they brought their offering before Yahuwah, six covered wagons and 12 oxen. So y'all get the picture? He's sanctifying the tabernacle. He's anointing it because this is going to be a set apart place. And we're going to have set apart instruments that we do the work of the most high. Come on. What did it say? Verse three. A wagon for two of the prince and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony, from between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. Are y'all hearing this? Now, where is this ark of the testimony at? Is it in the heavenlies or is it right there on earth? It's right there on earth, saints. They heard the voice. He heard the voice of the Most High speaking unto him off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubims he spake unto him and gave him all the words that he needed to give to the children of Israel, okay? Uh, I didn't put verse 89 there, but you can go back to read it yourself. Uh, Numbers chapter seven, verse 89. Let me show you how close Yeshua or Yahweh, let me show you how close he came to his people and how close he wanted to be among his people, the children of Israel. And this will help you to see uh, how he understood us and, and who we were. This is going to show you how close he was to his people. Let me show you this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 12. What did it say? Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whether thou shalt go forth abroad. And Stop right there. Stop right there. He said, thou shalt have a place outside of the camp. That's what it means, without the camp. Mm -hmm. A place that you shall go forth abroad. In other words, when it's time for you to relieve yourself or go to the bathroom, you need to have a place outside the camp. <laughs> he said, you don't be going to the bathroom within the camp. Remember, they were camping outside amongst one another and Yeshua was there in our presence and he said look here you got to have a place that's outside of the camp and, and, and a place that shall be abroad away from the camp and look at what he says come on whether thou shalt go forth abroad and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon so he said you're going to you're supposed to have a paddle you're a shovel or something yep. that you can dig when you go to the bathroom, if we want you to dig your stuff and, and watch, watch what it says. That's what that's what this paddle is. It's a likened unto a shovel. Okay? okay. Come on, what it say? And it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Are y'all hearing that? Are y'all <laughs> hearing it? This is the most <laughs> Say, look here, when y'all go to the bathroom, you got when you easing yourself, you better to dig a hole. Come on. And you turn back and you cover it up. Why was this important? Come on. For Yahuwah thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. So he didn't want to step in y'all what? <laughs> Your stuff. <laughs> he said, that's why you got to have a place outside the camp where you do your business. He said, abroad, make it far away from the camp. Because I'm the Lord, I'm the most, I'm walking in the midst of the camp and I don't want to step in no. Are y'all hearing that today? Come on, I'm walking in the midst of the camp to deliver thee. And to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. See, that's why the camp had to be holy. That's why you had to make sure you had your paddle and that you went far away from the camp to take care of your business. And he said, this camp is going to be holy because I'm walking in your midst. Everything Yaqua touches, and when his feet touches it, it becomes holy, set apart. Y'all hearing that today? Come on. Therefore, shall thy camp be holy, 
that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. So he ain't going to see you have unclean stuff and not covering up and being sloppy and being all jacked up. This is why you got to clean your room and make your bed and wash your face and comb your hair and get in the shower and clean yourself up. Are y'all hearing that? Because he's not interested in seeing no unclean thing in thee. When I get up to pray, I make sure I wash my face, brush my teeth. Are y'all hearing that? <laughs> I don't come to the Father, the breath still stinking, face ain't been washed. No, I will wash myself because we're coming in the presence of Yahweh. Are y'all hearing me today? He said he don't want to see no unclean thing among you so that he will turn away from thee. So this is important. This is important while we understand. That's where that understanding cleanliness is next to godliness because he don't want to see nothing unclean. He don't want to see that. He wants to see clean things and, and understanding that if he's been in your midst and you're communicating with him and he's around you in your presence, he wants things to be clean. Hallelujah. That's how close Yahweh is in our camp and in our midst. Let's see. Who wants to go to heaven? Because this is important for us to know as we understand this lesson. We got to see who wants to go to heaven and why is this message of us going to heaven? Why is it talked about and promoted all over the place? Every funeral you've been to, that's all they talk about is going to heaven. Let's see who wants to go to heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 16. What does it say, brother? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So who got fallen from heaven? That was Lucifer. That was the one, the angel and the dragon, and, and they fought against Michael and his angels, but they prevailed against. This is the uh, uh, who fell from heaven. Matter of fact, Yeshua said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. So how thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So Lucifer was fallen from heaven. He got removed from heaven because there was no more place. The father said, I ain't having it no more. He can never have access to the heavenly realm. Therefore, Michael and them took care of business and he got kicked out. Him and his angels got booted out of heaven and they got removed from that place. Come on. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Come Son on. of the morning. Yes, sir. How are thou cut down to the ground, which this weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart. So he said, how art thou cut down to the ground? He was removed from that heavenly place and brought down to the ground. Okay. This is because he said in his heart. Let's see what he said in his heart. This Lucifer. Come on. For thou hast said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stop right there. What did he say? I will ascend into heaven. heaven. Who wants to go to heaven? The, but the one that got removed and got kicked out of heaven. So he's the only one that's been trying to get back to heaven ever since. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Yah. Come on, what did he say? And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So this is Satan's message. This is Satan's card. This is how you know as saints of Yahweh who is representing Yahweh and who is representing the evil one. And again, there are many devils. Because it was Lucifer and his angels, they were all removed and kicked out together. So when people are talking, telling you that you going to heaven and talking about ascending and going there, you already know from the scriptures now what spirit is inspiring them and motivating them to say such things. Look at what it says. Let's finish this up. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. For the sides of the pit. Come on. They that see thee shall norally look up on thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? 
So even though he was trying to get back into the heavenly place, he said, ye shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. He was brought down from that heavenly place and he was sent and cast out from the book of Revelation tells us to the earth, okay? And, and this is what the scriptures is declaring to us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. This is why we have this happening. Come on. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. See, Satan says, if I can't beat you, then I'll try to join you. This is why we have false apostles, false preachers, false teachers, false doctors, deceitful workers, all transforming themselves as apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, trying to pawn off themselves as anointed, trying to pawn off themselves as ones who have been considered and chosen and handpicked by Yahweh himself. But these are false apostles, deceitful workers, and they transform themselves into apostles of, 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 of the anointed one. Look at what he says in verse 14, 15. Come on. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So I put this in here so that we can understand the dynamic here. There's been a dynamic that's been going on for quite some time. Satan has been transformed into an angel of light. And when his light come, we know that he's come bringing the knowledge of good and evil. And most people don't understand that they're leaning to evil. That's why everything is upside down. That's why it says good will be evil spoken of. See, when you're trying to keep the commandments and you're trying to go tell people, we got to keep the commandments of the most high, all of a sudden, you it's almost like you just cussed at somebody. <laughs> it's like, you you well, that's good, but your good now has become evil, and the things that are evil have now become good. We see homosexuality has risen all over this country. We know what the Bible says. The Bible says he created Adam and Kava, Adam and Eve, right? But yet still, people are clapping and, and, and applauding ones that they, uh, they say come out the closet and be men with men. All of a sudden, we know that that's an evil act and an evil thing, but Yahweh's word just said it. Yahweh's word declared homosexuality is wrong. Are y'all hearing that sentence? But the world and Satan... Uh, being transformed into an angel of light tells you that that's a good thing. It's a good thing to commit adultery. It's a good thing to, 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 to sin and to steal and to, and to have covetousness. That's what the world says. That's from Satan being transformed into an angel of light and his ministers being transformed into ministers of righteousness. And all they are doing is promoting the wickedness. They're not promoting the true good, but they're promoting what is wicked. And now what is really supposed to be good is called evil. And what is called evil now is being called good. This is happening right today in our modern times. And this is why, saints. So anybody talking about going to heaven are inspired by the Hasatan. And there are many devils. There are many satans. There are many deceitful workers. There are many false apostles and false preachers and teachers, false evangelists, false workers of, Yaku, of, of the Most High, and they have just transformed themselves into angels of light, but they're not truly the true servants of the Most High because they're not telling you the truth about what this word says, that the creator is come to earth and he's going to rule and reign from here. Are y'all hearing that saying? So who taught us this era? Who taught us this era? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. Come on, what did it say, brother? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice unto devils and not to God. 
So we got to understand that the Gentiles and the things that came from the Gentiles and the knowledge and the teachings of the Gentiles, and we know who the Gentiles are. When you go to Genesis chapter 10, it tells you who the Gentiles are in Genesis chapter 10. Those are the table of nations. So it says the things that the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to devils and not to Yah. So the things that come from Gentiles are only things that come from the devil. And they're not things that come from the Most High. Are y'all hearing that, saints? Come on, what it say? And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Woo! How more clear can the apostle talk today? He's letting us know, I don't want you to have fellowship with devils. I don't want you to continue on fellowshipping with devils because the things that the Gentiles are preaching and teaching and promoting are things that are not true, that are not right, because they truly sacrifice to devils and are not sacrificing to the Most High. And so when we say that uh, we learned something from the Baptist church, we connect the Baptist church, we connect the Methodist church, we connect the apostolic church, the non-denominational church, we can, we can point all of that back to the Roman Catholic Church, and then we can point the Roman Catholic Church all the way back to the Council of Nicaea when they instituted all of this stuff. Because the Gentiles sacrifice unto devils, and they don't sacrifice unto y'all. Are y'all hearing that? Come on, what did he say in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 and 21? Come on. He cannot drink the cup of Yahuwah and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of Yahuwah's table and of the table of devils. So he's flat out letting us know that if we're going to uh, uh, be drinking from the most highest table, we can't be also drinking from the devil's table. Why y'all fellowshipping with people that don't have this kind of understanding that we have? Because when you go over to the Gentile way of thinking and the Gentiles doctrines and to the Gentile understanding, I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are drinking from the cup of the devil. But when you're over here learning this truth and learning this word from the Hebrews and from the Israelites, that's when you're truly drinking from the cup of Yahweh. That's when you're truly drinking from the cup of the master. But when you go and listen and go and partake and listen to the ones that's on the other side, that minds have not been transformed into righteousness. They still keep it Sunday. They still keep it Easter, Ishtar. They still uh, 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 doing all of the pagan things that the father told us not to learn, not the ways of the heathens, learn not the ways of the Gentiles. They still think that uh, the creator's birth was on December 25th. They still practicing those things then you're eating and drinking from the cup of devils. And he said, you cannot be a partaker of Yahweh's table. You cannot, Israelites, you cannot. You cannot be a partaker of Yahweh's table and the table of the devil, the Hasatah. Are y'all hearing that today? I want to make this clear. You cannot eat and drink from both tables. This is what happened to Adam and Eve. They were given an opportunity. They were given an opportunity to do what? Eat from the tree of life. But instead of eating from the tree of life, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life all of a sudden became banned for them. They could no longer access the tree of life. And that's what Paul is declaring. And that's what he's telling us today. You can't drink from Satan's table and drink from the Lord. You can't do it. You're not going to be able to drink from, from, from the table of the Most High and the table of Hasatan. You can't fellowship or partake of that. Are y'all hearing that today? Hallelujah. Let's get back to our subject uh, uh, after we read this. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 18. This is why you can't drink from both cups. What did it say? And first, I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. He's talking about the Gentiles. Come on, look at what he say here. Oh, Yahuwah, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely 
our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Ooh, so the Gentiles are going to come and let us know that the things that they had been promoting on the face of this planet were all things they had inherited, lies. Now, who's the father of lies? Satan is the father of lies. All right, and they had inherited these lies and things that are vanity and things that really have no profit whatsoever at all. So the wrong people have been teaching this book to the world, and that's why we have so much confusion and so many things out of order and so many things in disarray. Hallelujah. Let's get back to the presence of the Most High. This is why Yahweh's presence went away from us. It's because of our sins and our transgressions and our stiff neckness. This is why he had to get away from us. Watch this here. Exodus chapter 33 and 1. What did it say? And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Depart, go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, or unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Watch what we're going to see here. This is after they made that golden calf, and Moses got upset. And he ended up throwing down and breaking the commandments. He had to go back up there uh, to talk to the Most High to get those commandments and instructions again. Uh, this is what the Father is, is saying. Look at what he said. Verse 2. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hevite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So the father is saying in verse one that, hey, he, re he remembered the promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, I'm going to give your seed this land. And I'm going to send an angel to drive out all of these nations here. And I'm going to bring you into the land that's flowing with milk and honey. But look at what he says right here. For thou art a stiff-necked people. Come on. Which I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put him on him his ornaments. So the Most High said, look here, I'm going to bring you to the land. I'm going to give you everything that I promise you, but I want to let you know that this is a stiff-necked people, and if I don't get away from y'all, I'm going to consume and kill every last one of y'all. <laughs> this is why the Most High's presence got away from us because of our stiff neckness. And if we continue, and if he continued to be in our presence, he was going to destroy and wipe us all off the planet. Are y'all hearing that? Come on, look at verse five. What did it say? For Yahuwah has said unto Moses, say unto the children of Israel, ye are a stiff necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Are y'all hearing that? This is why he had to get away from us. He had to take the uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and move it to another place because at first he was in our midst. But he said, because this people is so stiff-necked, I will come in the midst of thee in a moment and I'll consume thee. Come on. So therefore now, put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Hmm. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. He had put ornaments on them. He had made them be royal and holy and set apart people. But he said, man, no, y'all can't have those holy things on you, them holy things that I've, I I wanted you to, to wear and, and, and represent me. Take those things off of you so I can decide what I'm going to do. Strip yourself from all of them ornaments and all those holy things because y'all are not behaving like a holy people. Y'all are stiff-necked people, and I'm and I'm thinking about coming upon you in the midst in a moment and consuming every last one of you. Come on. What does it say, verse 7? And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Y'all see that? So Moses had to take the tabernacle that he made that represented the presence of, of Yahweh. He pitched it without the camp. Come on. Afar off from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of the congregation. So he called it the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the reason why. Come on. And it came to pass 
that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. So in other words, you had to leave from where you were at if you wanted to come and, uh, and, and seek the Most High. Come on. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. This is why Moses had to be the representative for the people to go speak to Yahweh. Those people in the camp was too stiff-necked. They just saw Moses leaving the camp because Moses High said, I'm not going to dwell in the midst of this stiff-necked and rebellious people. I can't do it because I will end up consuming every last one of them and causing the promise that I told to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob not to come to pass. But because I put my word above myself, pitch me outside of the camp. Pitch me away from these stiff-necked people. And when you want to seek me, you come out from among them and you come out to seek my face. And then I'll give you what thus says Yahweh. Are y'all hearing that? So they, they saw Moses going out of their presence, out of the camp. And the people, when they saw Moses going out there to seek Yahweh, all the people rose up and they stood at their tents and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle because the people were so stiff-necked, they didn't understand. They didn't value the presence of Yahweh. That's the point. They didn't value the presence of Yahweh, and neither do we today. We don't value the presence of Yahweh being in our midst. So therefore, the uh, the most I said, hey, take me somewhere else. Put me over here somewhere else because I'm going to end up consuming them. Come on. What did it say, brother? And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And Yahuwah talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Y'all see that? All the people could get was see the cloud, cloudy pillar standing at the tabernacle. They wasn't in on the conversation. They couldn't hear directly from Yahuwah. Remember, he had spoke to all of them. On the Mount Sinai, he had given them the covenants. They heard his voice. There was no nation that heard his voice like the children of Israel heard his voice. But because of their stiff-neckedness and their unwillingness to do the right thing, this caused the Most High to now be not in the midst of the camp, but the people could only see the cloud, the pillar at the tabernacle. And all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. They couldn't go out into the presence of the Most High because of their stiff neckness. And Most High only spoke to Moses as face to face as he speaketh unto a friend. They had to wait till Moses got through uh, uh, speaking to the Most High for Moses to come back to tell him what thus, tell them what thus says Yahweh. Y'all hear that today? He was withdrawn himself from among us. And no matter how much we wanted to seek him, the father said, I cannot be in the midst of people who are stiff-necked and rebellious. This is why we're telling everybody to keep the commandments and live. This is why we're telling everybody to repent and turn from your wicked ways. Have faith in Yeshua and keep his commandments because the father is going to be amongst his people that are holy and that are doing what he told them to do. Hosea chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Nevertheless, the most high will be found among his people. He will be found eventually among his people, but they are going to have to repent and turn from their wicked ways. Look at what he says in Hosea chapter five and five. Come on. And the pride of Israel do it testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Yes, sir. Yehuda also shall fall with them. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek Yahuwah, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. 
Y'all see that? They want to seek him. They want the desire to be in his presence. But the father said, no, I got to withdraw myself from you because you are stiff necked people and I might consume you in a moment. So this is why the fathers withdrew his spirit from the children of Israel. Look over here in Isaiah 57 and 15. What it say? For thus said, the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So this is where they was asking, where's the God of Elijah? Where's the God? He had left and said, I'm dwelling in the high and holy place. I had to not even be in the tabernacle no more. I got to dwell in the high and holy place with him also. That is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So he said, I got to withdraw myself even more from these people. He came down unto his people, and but we know they rejected him. He put on a flesh suit so that he could die for the sins of his people. He said, I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he came to die. He came to give up the ghost. He came uh, uh, that we might have a life and have that life more abundantly. He came to, as a ransom for us. Without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. And even though he was here in the flesh, we still rejected him. And this is why when he comes back again, he's not coming back in the same way. Prophecy, Matthew chapter 25 31 through 32. What did it say, brother? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. So this is when he comes back. This is where he comes back. He's going to sit upon the throne of his glory. Well, what throne of glory is he coming back to sit upon? Is this a throne in heaven or is this a throne on the earth? Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. What does it say? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yahushua. He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest. And Yahuwah God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Are y'all hearing that? He's coming to sit on the throne of his father, David. And where is that throne at? It's in Jerusalem, and it's here on the earth. Come on, Luke 1 and 33, come on. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of all his kingdom, there shall be no end. He's not going to do it from the heavenly realm, but he's going to do it here on the earth. That's what we want you to see because Yahweh desires to be in the presence of his people. Psalms 132. Come on, read. What does it say, brother? And Yahuwah remembered David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto Yahuwah and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Yahuwah and a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. So even David understood how important it was for us, for the Most High to be among us, to be in our midst. He understood that. He said, I'm not going to go to my place of rest, my place, uh, my house, my home, until I find a place for Yahweh to dwell so that he can be mighty among us as his people. Come on, what it say? Yahuwah hath sworn in truth unto David, 
he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of the body will I set upon thy throne. For Yahuwah hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So again, Yahuwah desires what? Desires to be here on the earth. He's chosen Zion. He desired it for his habitation. So this is the desire of the Most High, of Yeshua HaMashiach, of the King, to be dwelling in our midst on the earth and not in the heavenly realm. He will dwell for I have desired it. This is his desire to dwell among his people. Yahweh will be king over the earth forever. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, we'll conclude with this passage of scripture. What does it say, brother? And thus said Yahuwah, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of Yahuwah of hosts, the holy mountain. Hallelujah. Are y'all hearing that? Hallelujah. This is going to happen after a whole lot of people die, a whole lot of people going to be killed. Because for Yahweh to set up his kingdom, a whole lot of people are going to have to die and a whole lot of people are going to have to be killed because the more the people that's on this planet loves evil more than they love good. They love what Satan has more than what Yahweh has. So a whole lot of people are going to have to die so that Yahweh uh, can set up and rule his kingdom from the earth. Know that. Let's finish up Zechariah 14, 1 through 4, and then verse 9. Come on, what does it say, brother? Behold, the day of Yahuwah hath cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Yes. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Come on. Then shall Yahuwah go forth and fight against those nations. And when he falls in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, yes. which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half of it toward the south. Come on. And Yahuwah shall be king over all the earth. No, over all of the heavenly realm. <laughs> over all the earth. <laughs> In other words, he's going to be ruling over the earth. That's the point. Come on. And that day shall there be one Yahuwah in his name, one. Hallelujah. So he's Hallelujah. coming to rule on the earth, and we're going to bear witness to this word and be, bear witness to this truth that he's coming to rule and establish his kingdom on the earth. And his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. It shall never expire. It shall never go away, but it'll be from everlasting to everlasting. The tree of life is coming back in our midst and we'll be able to eat from that tree of life and live forever. We're going to, he's going to uh, uh, redeem or, or repair these vile bodies and fashion it to liken unto his glorious body. And we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the seventh trump, the last trump is going to sound. And uh, we're going to be changed. This mortal going to put on immortality. This corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. And we're going to be changed. And we'll be able to eat from that tree of life. All of those that keep the commandments and have the faith of Yeshua HaMashiach will have a right to eat from the tree of life and live forever. Hallelujah. Behold the nail, behold the hand. Shabbat Shalom, saints of the Most High. Yahweh's desire to live among his people. Hallelujah. 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 How many people received that word today? Yes.